This is an August group, and, and I really appreciate Kat and Peter and Brewster and, and, and all of you for coming and investing your time to work, as Brewster said, to make this open platform for digital publications you know, come, come to be. I'm going to spend a few minutes today talking about one, one aspect of that platform, one relatively small aspect, uh, this format called EPUB. Um, I think it's kind of putting the cart before the horse because, as you'll see, I, I don't really think that, that, that EPUB or any one format is, is the center of the problems we need to solve to make everything happen for, for browsing, reading, you know, social, exciting, beautiful books. Um, but it is, it is one piece of the puzzle, and I want to give you guys some information about it and about the work going on to take it further, in which I hope you'll participate. So the International Digital Publishing Forum, the group that I'm the executive director of, has a mission to make digital publications available globally and make sure that they're accessible and rich. So that's our, our mission as an organization. We do that by developing and promoting open standards, primarily the standard uh, known as uh, EPUB. How many people here know what EPUB is? Great. Wow. That's awesome. How many people here are, are in-depth knowledgeable about EPUB 3, the latest version? A smaller chunk. Well, well, okay. So what is EPUB 3? Well, actually, I'm not going to talk to you about it because you can go get the O'Reilly book. <laughs> and and uh, I'm desperately excited that at this time last year, I gave a small talk about what we were planning for EPUB 3 only one day after the off-site face-to-face uh, -face meeting where the IDPF working group decided what we thought we needed to put into EPUB 3. So it was a little more than a gleam in the eye a year ago, not even, not even a spec draft, and now it's done. Uh, the IDPF membership two weeks ago unanimously approved uh, EPUB 3 to become a final recommended specification. And again, the proof here is the, is the, is the O'Reilly book with an animal on it. And uh, I would encourage you to go get it from, from, from the O'Reilly site in order to financially support O'Reilly as a contributor to this event. Uh, the price, however, is free, so, so it's even better. Um, free is a good price. Um, but we're working with O'Reilly on additional materials on EPUB 3, not, not all of which will necessarily be, be free. So I think it's, it's a good starting point to start there. And I'm really not going to talk about the technology in EPUB 3 today. I'm going to go talk about other more, more fundamental, um, hopefully, fundamental uh, business issues. And it started for me when I was at Frankfurt a couple weeks ago, and I saw this slogan, books for everybody. And it kind of got me excited, you know, wow, books for everybody. And I saw that there's a a talk later today, or during this program, that has a similar theme, uh, except in Spanish. And it really made me think, wow, we're, this is a distillation of this mission the IDPF has to create this open platform. I mean, all that good words about accessible and global and blah, 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 it kind of boils down to this. But then I realized, as I was talking to publishers and other vendors there at Frankfurt, that we are in incredibly disruptive times. The, world, the value chain of publishing that's been in place for hundreds of years is shifting under our feet. We don't know how to, how to keep making money if we're traditional publishers. We don't know how to come up with a business model that makes sense if we're startups in this space. Everyone is working to figure out how to actually make a business, and at the end of the day, to make readers, to give readers beautiful, compelling content and experiences and value authors and publishers who create that content need to be compensated. So we can say books for everyone and say, great, uh, we got a standard, we got books for everyone, but it's kind of like ponies for everybody. You know, I mean, you know, it starts to kind of reek of, of over-promising and, and, and really not focusing on the business realities. And my organization, the IDPF, is, is a trade association. Our members are over 250 organizations, including both of, the, both of the organizers of this conference, um, the Internet Archive and, and, and O'Reilly, and many others. In fact, I think I, have, I might have a quorum of board members here in the audience today, which means I have to be really careful what I say. Um, but because the next thing I'm going to say is that standards have no value. There, there's, there's nothing about standards themselves that are in any way meritorious. And in fact, many of them are injurious. Um, uh, the, the purpose of a standard is to improve the efficiency of a solution that uses them. And, and, and if it doesn't improve the efficiency, it, it shouldn't and won't get used. So a standard in the IT world or, or in the plumbing world um, is just a way to make things faster, cheaper, better. And that's, that's all, all that it's good for. All this talk about open platform is only good if that open platform accelerates your business, because otherwise the readers aren't going to have the books, the beautiful books, that you need to get paid for creating and distributing. Otherwise it's just fictional ponies. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about what is in EPUB 3 that, that addresses that improved efficiency and then, and then talk a little bit about what's beyond there. So EPUB 3, first of all, is a global solution 
Uh, unlike the previous versions of the standard, we now have vertical writing support, support for advanced typographic, typographic features like writing direction and page progression direction, uh, Ruby, and, and other things that are needed to make Chinese, Taiwanese, Hebrew, Arabic, and other languages uh, really work. And what's exciting to me about, about that is that EPUB is based on web standards. But this is a case where the web standards had been languishing because in the browser context, not all of these typographic richnesses were necessarily deemed of broad enough horizontal interest. We worked together with the W3C, the organization who works on web standards and their key browser vendors and other members, and breathed new life into the CSS drafts relevant to these areas. Working with teams in, in Japan and China and Taiwan and other places, we worked not only on the specs, but on implementation that's now moved into the WebKit open source code base. And now, because of the work on EPUB 3, we're going to get vertical writing and global language support, not just for ebooks, but in browsers for everybody. So it's a great example of me of where the, the IDPF, as a vertical organization of people who care about publishing interests, can go and advance web standards, not just, not just sort of wait for them to happen and then, and then piggyback on them. So it was really a, a good example, and, and one that we're now replicating in other, other areas of standardization you know, beyond global language support. So that's one key area. Another is, is content that goes beyond digitized text and pictures. And the O'Reilly book says that, that, uh, that, that um, EPUB 3 is for multimedia books, so, and O'Reilly doesn't lie, so it must be true. So what, one thing that that enables is us to break the boundaries of just thinking about a digital book as something that was done, was sort of born print and, and became digital. I think digitization will, with all due respect to Brewster and the Internet Archive, I think digitization is a backwards looking thing. And the future is thinking about what the digital medium enables, just as we don't think of a movie as a filmed stage play, we're not going to think of the digital beautiful book as simply a digitized print book anymore. So EPUB 3 makes that possible, and it makes it possible not just on one platform, not just for iPad and, I, and, and iPhone, not just for Android, but it makes it possible with one set of tools, one creation process to get that out everywhere. Now EPUB's not doing that based on any uh, innovation that is native to EPUB. In fact, EPUB really is just doing that based on its its basis in HTML5, which is the modern version of web standards and, and all the pieces that, that go into that. There's a, another O'Reilly book called What is HTML5? So you can read that for uh, more details there. But a key thing about HTML5, and we're probably going to hear a lot about HTML5 during, during this, this two days, is that it's optimized for web applications. The W3C and the browser vendors who promote and produce uh, HTML are focusing on applications building on the browser stack. That's fantastic. But it means that the web's original roots as a document format have kind of been lost. You might say that, that uh, the W3C uh, threw the semantic web under the bus you know, uh, of, of web applications. Um, and it's really exciting that, that the web applications enable something like Angry Birds to be done in complete native HTML and JavaScript and run in standard browsers without any plugins, no Flash, no, no nothing. That's very, very exciting. But if you wanted to take that Angry Birds code and do something with it, you'd find that the only thing you can really do is toss it into a browser and see what happens. HTML5 content is a spaghetti mismatch, mishmash of, of JavaScript, data, style sheets, markup that's not even in a, in a reliable format because it's, it's using, quote, tag soup uh, markup. Um, and it's not something that you can manipulate. You can't easily slice and dice it. You can't easily mix it in and mash it up. It's possible to try, but those processes that work with arbitrary HTML are, are inherently challenged because of the focus of HTML on apps and the resulting lack of structure. And from publishing's point of view, publishing means scale. We all make books one at a time in an authoring point of view. Every book is a handcrafted artisan effort. But the definition of being a publisher is that you do that over and over again. I don't want to denigrate the outcome as being um, homogenous, but the result is, for readers, much more content available. That's a hallmark of publishing, is that you get a lot of content. And in order to do that, you need to have scale. You need to be able to create content over and over again, which means you can't afford to do it a different way every time. And you don't have the budget of a game developer studio, where you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars uh, per title. That just doesn't make sense. So in some respects, EPUB 3 is just HTML5 that isn't wild anymore. It's, it's been domesticated. That means it's structured, it's navigable, it's packaged, it's XML, and the result of all that means that it's interoperable. It means you can take EPUB 3 content and exchange it with anyone else who can accept or emit EPUB 3 content. 
So it's a, a lingua franca, you might say. That is what gives it its power. Now, we're going to hear probably in these next couple of days about people who have other ways to package HTML5. We heard uh, last week from a, another company up in Seattle who is talking about an HTML5-based format. <laughs> well, they, th their formats may deliver some of these benefits, although, again, when the documentation is not done in, out in the open in a transparent way, we don't really know yet. But whether they deliver some of these benefits or not, it won't deliver the interoperable benefit because it does it in a different way. It's not that EPUB3's way is fantastic any more than JPEG was the best imaging format. But the point of having a standard is that everyone can agree and interoperate on that standard. JPEG for images became that standard. And my job, and I hope all of your job, is to help create standards here for, for publishing that work across systems, not just within silos, but across the silos and break down those silos. So we've been talking about distributing content kind of in a, in a channel-based model, but I want to point out that you can use EPUB3 for applications and websites too. And in the case of applications, one existence proof is uh, from our, still from our friends at O'Reilly. I, I guess I keep leaning on them for examples. Uh, oh, iPhone, the missing manual, was an early success title on the App Store. But under the covers, it's actually EPUB content. EPUB content using a reading system that in turn uses the built-in Safari browser engine on the, on the iPhone. So that was a very efficient way for them to build the title. The content producers and the editors and producers and, and, and others could create the content in EPUB, hand it over the, over the wall to the developers who didn't have to worry about what it was going to come over and they knew it would be EPUB, and they could then render it and focus on the, the rich experience, the navigation, everything else that made it an app. So if you are going to make an app, you may still decide that EPUB, that civilized HTML5, makes sense for you as a faster path to market and as a way to become cross-platform because with frameworks like PhoneGap and others, you can easily take a browser-based app, an app that has a browser at its center with EPUB as the data, and move it from iPhone to Android to Microsoft to other platforms. So that's something that you can also apply to a website. Now, in a website, you may not want to send a packaged EPUB file across the wire, but on the way into your content management system, EPUB may be a very good format to control and specify the content you receive, again, so that you know you're getting something reliable, you know that you're getting something structured, and then you can easily ingest it and, and put it forward into your into your um, web-based solutions. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But meantime, let me talk about some of the other things that EPUB does for your, for your um, app, for your solutions. So EPUB is designed to let content reflow. And probably most people know that, that EPUB, unlike PDF, which is always a sequence of final form pages, can adapt. You can have EPUB that has three columns on a large screen, has two columns on a, on a tablet, and one column on an, on an iPhone. And it's not, letting, not making you pan and zoom around in order to consume that content. So that's a basic benefit of EPUB. The web actually started with that, but you know, these days very few websites anymore actually give you a reflowing experience. That part of the HTML promise kind of got lost along the way uh, to HTML focusing on web applications. But EPUB 3 goes beyond that reflow model, uh, which puts the burden on the reading system to make the book beautiful and allows the publisher to make beautiful books. Because we now have support for CSS absolute positioning, we have support for scalable vector graphics, SVG, and so you could make books that are fixed layout. And these are commercial books now already being sold uh, by Apple in the iBook store because Apple's already implemented probably more than half of the EPUB 3 features in, in their iBooks application. So you may have content that is inherently a final form. It doesn't make sense for it to reflow, or, or you just want to provide that beautiful experience uh, for a large screen. You may have content with a two-page spread. Of course, magazines often have this, but this, this actually is, is from a book. And you may want to add multimedia and interactivity to that content. This title was developed completely in an automated translation process from InDesign all the way out through to EPUB for the iBook store, and it's, it's and, and by Hachette Leaf, one of the largest publishers in France. And it has audio, video, and, and interactivity in JavaScript added to it. That was a key reason for them to move away from using PDF to EPUB because EPUB is based on web standards. So you can add that kind of interactivity rich media using the standard techniques. And again, you've still got interoperable content. So that, that fixed layout, I think, is going to help us create beautiful books as well the IDPF is working to enhance the reflow, enhance the adaptive layout. Uh, and that's an, an activity under, that's just kicking off right now. So the last feature of EPUB 3 I want to talk about is kind of a geeky one about making content accessible. But I think it's a very, very, very important one. I'm delighted that the IDPF has partnered with the DAISY Consortium and that EPUB 3 now is taking forward the mantle 
to be the standard delivery format for digital books for people with visual disabilities, replacing something called Daisy DT Book, which was a specialized format actually based on an earlier version of EPUB um, that now is, is, the work is all moving to EPUB 3. So accessibility for the visually impaired doesn't just mean blind people. Many of us who are getting a little older may want a larger print at certain times, and every ebook can be a larger print book. We may have physical disabilities. I have a friend who's had a stroke. Ebooks brought back reading to him, not because his vision is, is challenged, but because his physical condition is challenged. Many people are dyslexic. They need different styles of reading and consumption. And then everyone is a learner at some time. Most of us learn to read at a time where we are listening as well as watching. In EPUB 3, we have a feature called Media Overlays that allows audio to be synchronized with books, with, with, the, with the visual display of text. That synchronization is not only great for seeing the bouncing ball over books if you're a kid, but it lets you listen to a digital book in the car and then keep on reading it when you get home. Apple's, again, already shipped this EPUB 3 feature in the iBooks application, and I'm very excited about it because it, this all has nothing to do with a tiny slice of disabled people. This has to do with making your content accessible to a larger market and adding new business models like combo audio ebooks that you can make more revenue from and again serve more readers. So really accessibility is for all of us and enabling a vastly larger market. So that's a, kind of a, a real brief tour of, of what EPUB 3 brings to the table, I would say feature by feature, but I want to step back and talk about the strategic impact. From a publisher point of view specifically, I believe it's important to think of EPUB 3 not just as a tactical means to get content out, but as a strategic weapon. A lot of vendors, big and small, are telling you about their great solution, and they'll tell you how to make even more beautiful books. But remember, every vendor kind of wants to see this outcome. They would love to see the playing field tilted towards them. And as a publisher, you're better off distributing your channel, your, your content, as much, as broadly as possible to as many readers as possible. The last thing you want is to limit the availability of your content, and you definitely don't want to be locked in to one or more vendors' platforms and only be able to deliver your content through that. By standardizing on EPUB 3, you're ensuring that you're making content available in a quality form to uh, everyone and it, by insisting that they take it. And I'm really delighted that even our friends in Seattle have more and more been, been receiving and, and accepting uh, EPUB uh, from their supply chain. In fact, most of the books being sold on the Kindle store came to them as EPUB. And their new version, KF8, likely looks like just to be another step towards alignment with and support of uh, EPUB 3. But we do have to be careful. There is the possibility that in some geographies, the commercial distribution of digital books could end up in the control of one company. That would not be the open platform that Brewster talked about. I think that would, it's almost inconceivable that books, these artifacts that are so key to our culture, could be controlled by any one company. I think the mission of books and browsers is to, to make that not happen. And again, from a publishing point of view, if that happens, you know where the profits are gonna flow. The profits are gonna flow, as we've seen from, from iTunes and iPod, to the vendor that ends up in control. If somebody gets a stranglehold on distribution, then they will get the profits. That's not gonna be good for publishers, authors, and ultimately, therefore, not for readers. And so many readers see that. Many readers and their advocates, advocates in libraries, advocates in, in organizations like the Internet Archive, see the benefits of open platform and see the threat of one or more companies ending up in control. And they want to fundamentally get content where they want to get it. By adopting the right standards, you can ensure that your content gets to them wherever they want to go. Now, stepping back, we've been talking about books and artifacts, but really, books are changing in the web world. And I think that's what gets me really excited about this next two days, is to see some examples here of books, not without Borders, Inc., but, but books that are permeable, <laughs> books that are connected, books that are dynamic, who get their content in real time, books that are socially created and consumed. And there's a spectrum that I see from the book as an artifact that still makes sense in some cases, to the book as an experience that's more like a game to the book as a tool where really you might just start calling it an app. And all these things are valid. I'm, I'm not suggesting that, uh, in fact, EPUB will be suitable in all these cases. I just believe that it's important to have an interoperable standard that allows the content to flow, especially when it's in a narrative form, whether that's a short 
narrative or a long narrative or an assemblage of narratives. That's what EPUB's you know, design center and strength is. And we're going to start seeing the browsers much more natively supporting this. Some people say, well, forget all this stuff. Can't we just get the browser to paginate? And that would save a lot of problem. And then we don't have to worry about these kind of reading system things. And in fact, Opera has just released on Opera Labs an experimental browser that with one line of CSS, you know, setting the overflow to paged, will paginate. It's pretty awesome. With one more line of CSS, you can have it string together multiple chunks of HTML. So no, no EPUB needed, you might say. And actually, I think that's a good thing. But uh, we should remember that just teaching a browser to paginate doesn't deliver all the things that makes EPUB what it is. If you want content that's structured, you want content that's navigable, packaged, you want to be able to use XML-based tools, and you want to be interoperable with all the EPUB 3 solutions, then you're going to want to use the real deal. And the packaging one is, is a little bit of a sore point, because in, for many of us doing browser-based things, we find it awkward to ship around big, giant zip files. And we want to have resources that are distributed across a set of web endpoints. And it's just not sensible to package a book together in a single file. And I want to make it clear that EPUB is not .epub. Technically, at the moment, what we've specified is what lives in a .epub file. But there's really several piece parts to EPUB. There is the container format, which is what defines that, that zip-based package. There's the publications specification, which defines all the metadata and, the, and you might say, the, the ingredients and how they relate together to make the whole. And then there's the specification of the content itself. The content documents really is just how HTML5 and CSS and SVG come together in EPUB. We don't define a subset of HTML5. We define just some, some basic rules, like using the XML serialization, XHTML5. And Media Overlays defines the mapping between pre-recorded audio or video and, and text. Those four specs together make EPUB. And it's not necessary that in all situations that you have the packaged version. In fact, we're, we, we have an action item left over from our EPUB 3 development to work more on the network distributed flavor of an EPUB. I hope it can be lighter weight and that some of the, you might say, the baggage of the physical packaging and some of the distinction between the web world and EPUB can fall away as we work on this distributed form of publications. And at 5 p.m. tonight, I, th I think we're going to have a little kind of informal workshop. So whoever wants to come and, and, and sort of get involved in what's next for EPUB in general and specifically around network distributed publications, I hope you'll show up at 5 and we'll have just a kind of a round table brainstorming session and, and you can help make it happen. So to, to summarize, I want to give you my biased view of, of, of where, what, what EPUB is all about. We have PDF, a great format if what you want is ePaper. If what you want is a sequence of pages in final form, locked, it, locked down and locked together, then e PDF is, is, is great. We have HTML, which is the platform for everything else in the world, the platform for applications, the platform for experiences around data. What EPUB is, first, foremost, and really all, is simply a way to take that web platform and make it suitable for many of the things you would have needed a document to do, a PDF document to do, in the past. The less we need to do for EPUB, the more that we can do in HTML5 itself and the web standards itself, the other web standards, the better. We exist because the W3C and the browser makers aren't always worrying about publishing concerns. We are. That's why I've got my whole board here. So working with the IDPF lets you make sure that the web platform evolves to meet the needs of publishing. And I want to make sure you realize that, that it is your EPUB. Many of the people in this room helped create EPUB3. I hope many of these people in the room are going to help create the future of EPUB. But I do want to make sure that you understand that the future of publishing is definitely not EPUB. The future of publishing, it's definitely not web standards either. These are just plumbing. These are just the things that make your job more efficient. If, if they make them less more efficient, you should use them. And if not, you should skip them. Really, the future of publishing is up to you. It's up to the beautiful books that many of you are going to make and distribute. Thank you very much. I think I have time for a few more questions, few questions. But again, we have a 5 p.m. thing, so thank you. I would ask that you all, don't, don't ask me about the future. Just show up at 5 and help us make the future. But if any other questions uh, other than future, uh, I'm happy to try to address. Any? Surely there must be yes. Oh, you want me to go back to that? This one.
Uh, this is an experimental um, reading thing called the Opera Reader that Opera recently re released. So um, one of the interesting things about the web thing is there's four or five different browser makers that, that you know, can put a toe in the water and experiment and see if other people will, will, will jump in or not. This was done, um, the idea of an overflow paged making a browser paginate with that, just making it that simple is not a new idea. It's been around for a while, but they were the first uh, to deliver it just, just a couple weeks ago. So I'm, you can download and check it out. I didn't install it on this computer, which is not mine, so I can't demo it here today and don't have time. But um, it's, it's worth checking out, but it's also worth remembering that while browsers paginating will make EPUB much easier to do, there's more to it than that. Although I'd, I would expect, and actually I'm willing to make the bet with anyone who wants to, that within the next year, we'll have several of the major browsers directly and natively supporting EPUB. So, other questions? Okay, thank you very much.